we are learning to lean on Jesus. Yes, His arms are the everlasting arms. And when we lean on Jesus, we can be certain that he will never fail us. I am very delighted to be here in your beautiful sanctuary and to enjoy the cool ambiance that is conducive for worship and fellowship. I have always enjoyed coming to this church. This is my third visit, third time I'm standing in this pulpit. I want to thank my dear brother and friend, Pastor McLean, and of course his board and the ratifiers and framers, developers of this program for inviting me to be here. I have come to have a good time in Jesus. Yeah, amen. You know, I believe that when we come to the house of the Lord, we must come with an expectation to have something delivered to us straight from the throne room of heaven. Yeah. We must come believing that there is a God who wants us to be in his presence and who has something in store for each of us uniquely, individually. And I am just happy to be a part of whatever God has in store for you. Now, we will be fellowshipping together for the next two weeks, and I want to invite you to bring somebody with you each night as you come each day, and each night there will be the daytime services and Sabbaths, and of course the evening services. I invite you to invite your loved ones and your neighbors. It's a good time to have your Facebook <coughs> friends those who are living in proximal areas, invite them over to come and join with us as we worship the Lord. And your WhatsApp friends and colleagues, invite them to be with us. Tonight, I want to speak to us in perhaps the most fundamental of all Christian tenets. That is the reality of God. We must begin with an understanding of God. And so today, tonight, we will talk about the reality of God. Before we talk together, I invite you to Pray with me. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our gracious Father, the moment has come for you to speak to us from your sacred word. We are listening, our Lord. May your Holy Spirit grant us the inspiration that we are so badly in need of. Touch my brain cells, touch my body. May I be the little instrument in your hands that you will use to bring a blessing to your people. And if you're, when your people are blessed, we shall remember it's not the chisel in the hand of the sculptor that deserves the glory, but all glory must go to the Lord. Thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Does so God say amen? amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The reality of God. From time immemorial, or before the dawn of civilization as we know it, man has had a belief in a supernatural being that is commonly and traditionally called God. Historians and cultural anthropologists have told us that every culture in every civilization, both ancient and modern, has had some semblance of, the of a theological structure or belief system. In fact, belief in God 
has been as ubiquitous as the use of water or the consumption of food. There seems to be an innate or inborn instinct or desire to reach out and recognize the power or being whose existence clarifies or contextualizes man's deepest, indomitable, and undying longings to have fellowship with a God he may not see but cannot honestly deny. Greek philosophy of the pre-Christian era recognize metaphysical concepts as truth, power, beauty, love, and justice as transcendent qualities that must have a source beyond the mundane and the natural. Aristotle spoke candidly of one who was the uncaused the cause, the unaffected effect, the actualizing agent, or the prime mover. David Hume, John Stuart Mills, and most recently William Lane Craig have posited the fundamental truth that out of nothing, nothing comes. So if there is a universe, there must be a natural and sufficient cause for the universe. There must be an intelligent power with all its immensity that we see, whether we look through the microscope or the telescope, there must be someone responsible for time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter, the three realities that we have come to know. Uh, these three cosmic realities must have come into existence at the same time. Why? Is if you've got space and matter without time, when would you put it? Or if you've got matter and time without space, where would you put it? The good news is that we are not left in darkness. The Hebrew scriptures clarify clearly and succinctly answer the profound question for us. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, time. God created the heavens, space. And the earth matter. Uh, somebody says that this is a, a trinity of trinities at work, in that God created the trinity of, existing, of, of existential realities as we know them time, space, and matter. Each of them exists in, in three forms. Time exists as past, present, and future. Space exists as length, breadth, and width. And matter as solid, liquid, and gas. So a, a trinity of trinities created a trinitarian reality. We are talking about a God who is wise enough and big enough to have brought all these things into existence. This is the God of creation. David says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Paul, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, he says the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Paul's argument is cogent, concrete, and compelling. He says that the power and divine nature of God are clearly seen in the things that God has made. Uh, the, the word shows, gives evidence of intelligent design, therefore there must be an intelligent designer. Uh, anywhere we see um, anything that is intelligible, you know, if you walk on the beach and you see a stone, you could say, well, over millions of years, this stone probably comes about. But if you walk on the beach and you see a McDonald's wrapper, then you know the prison, you know that there must be some mind behind this thing that you're looking at. When you look at the human DNA, you see that there is information. And as long as there is information, there must be a mind behind the information. This is intelligent information. The point I'm making, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that nature, according to Paul, nature is replete with the footprints and fingerprints of a big God. Uh, you may choose to believe it or you may choose not to believe it. But I want to let you know that truth is not truth because people believe it. Truth is truth even if you don't believe it. Uh, our God exists 
you can believe it, but our God still exists even if you choose not to believe it. Because that's the nature of truth. It doesn't become true because somebody believes it. Truth is universal. Our God is awesome. By the way, I should like to point out to you that only a God could spark the hydrogen fusion in a ball of fire called the sun and flung it 93 million miles away, then place the moon 239,000 miles away and yet make them occupy the same volume of space, making it possible for a total solar eclipse. Only a God could wrap and engineer the liquid transportation system of 60,000 miles of blood vessels in the human body, enough that could stretch from Florida to Alaska 12 and a half times. Only a God could do that. Only a God could spin the earth with the incredible angular velocity of 1,037 miles per hour, while at the same time revs the earth along a 150 million kilometer orbit at a speed of 66,000 miles an hour around the sun in 365 and a quarter days without ever veering off course, not even for a millisecond. Only a God could do that. What an awesome God we serve. The heavens truly declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There is no God like our God. Psalm 14 verse 1 says that from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Our God does not serve two terms in the White House and then he goes it out of office. From everlasting to everlasting, the Bible says, He is God. He will always be around. My God is completely unique and I am happy that I can depend on God's constancy. He will never run out of substance, never run out of energy. My God is an eternal God. Let's uh, dig a little deeper into this being called God. The Bible says uh, that God is omniscient, which means that he's the only being in the universe that cannot <laughs> learn anything. Uh, there is nothing for God to learn. Anything that can be learned, God already knows about it. God knows science. He knows mathematics. He knows chemistry. God knows your mother, he knows your father, he knows your neighbor, but most of all, God knows you. He knows your problems and perplexities, he knows your pain, he knows how much you have suffered, and he knows how, he knows how much you can endure. He knows what you need to know, and God normally shares with you what you need to know. You know, there are some things that you know, you don't know how you know, you just know that you know. And God has a way of sharing with you what you need to know, and God knew we needed to know about Him, and God has given us an incontrovertible evidence that He is in existence. Somebody say amen. But you know, beloved friends, I get excited when I talk about this God. Because this God wants us to know him. In Jeremiah 9 verse 23 he says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the mighty man glory in his might, but let him that glory glory in this, that he understands and knows me. God is not a mere concept to be dissected and debated by scholars and intellectuals. God is not a mere tenet of prayer books, hymnals and litanies. God is a real person. And God wants to have a real relationship with us. Matthew 6 and verse 33, he says, Seek me first and my kingdom, and I will add all other things unto you. The problem with modern man is that he doesn't want to seek God first. He wants to seek money first. Now, please don't get me wrong. Money is wonderful. And I wish I had as much as Pastor McLean. But money, money with all its beauty and all its spending power, there are just some things that money can't do. Money can buy you dinner at a famous New York restaurant, but only God can give you the appetite to enjoy it. Money can buy you a nice bed, but only God can give you true rest when nighttime comes. Uh, money can buy you a fancy house, but only God can change that house into a happy home. I'm saying we should get our priorities right instead of expending all our energies in pursuit of that which is perishable. We need to search for God because the Bible says you shall search for me and find me when
when you search with all your heart. God is an awesome God and He wants to have a relationship with us. Now, beloved, because God is so powerful, we are not supposed to be living lives of weakness. What are you talking about, Pastor? It seems that like the modern Christian is a metaphor for weakness. We haven't accomplished much for the Lord. The apostles, with the power of God, without big budgets, without computers, without air-conditioned SUVs, without satellite and internet, they took the gospel across the then known world. And today, with all our technological sophistication, with all our dollars, with all our machinery and computers, we're still struggling. There are people tonight in places of the earth who have never heard the name Jesus in all their lives. Think of Bangkok, Thailand. Bangkok is a city of 11 million people. Less than 1% has ever heard the name Jesus. I saw them interviewing uh, some folks on the streets once and they asked a man who was in his service, have you ever heard of Jesus? He said, who? When you look at the map, when you look at the, 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 the lines of latitude that when they uh, look at the 1040 window, you find millions of people, millions of people, millions who have never heard the name Jesus. Where is the power of the Christian? Where is it? Beloved friends, God never intended for us to live lives of weakness. As a Christian church, God wants us to experience the power of God. I ask the question, what is a cell phone if the battery dies and it has no power? Of what use is my vacuum cleaner if it has no power? How can a microwave be of any significant usefulness to me if it has if there is no power? God expects us as Christians to experience his power. In fact, John chapter 17 and verse 3, the Bible says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Notice here, the Bible says it's life eternal to know God. Now, there are two Greek words for know. There is the word ginusku, which means to, to know through intellectual accent. But then there is the word epigenusku, which means to know through experience. What the Bible is saying is that God, the awesome God, the powerful God, He expects all of us to know Him through experience that His power might be resident in our lives. We are, we are going around with the same irritations for 15 years. The same boxes giving us trouble, the same neighbors, the same issues. Where is the power of God, the awesome God, the creator God? Where is that power in our experience? You know, I was at a school once. I was matriculating to study medicine. I was studying medicine. And I remember one day this particular lady who walked in class. And she was very bumptious. She was just arrogant. And uh, she was a very arrogant atheist. And she said, listen, folks, only evolution makes sense of biology. And we will be, we will be discussing biology in an atheistic framework. And yeah, all of you Bible-believing people in here, if you want to do anything otherwise, you do it out of my class. Do you understand me? Well... It wasn't just a class of students. There happened to be a preacher in the class. I was in the class. And I said, God, when I walked to the class today, I said, God, I don't want this bio teacher, you know. I said, I want another teacher. You know what I said? I said, God, I want another teacher. And I got on my knees and I said, God, I don't think I can go through the semester with this teacher at all. Uh, her, her, her arrogance is just repugnant. I can't take it. I want another teacher. Believe me as I stand here. When I get to class the next day, there was another bio teacher. And it was not just a bio teacher. I am saying, if God is real, then he must be real in our experience. Beloved, I have challenged myself. 
that as long as I am around, I must not just uh, be a Christian in word and doctrine and theology. I must be a Christian who knows that my God is real. You know, I am the public religious, the, the public affairs and religious liberty director for my conference. You know, my office has to do with, with religious freedom. I am supposed to have the correct interpretation of the Constitution and the labor laws. And if there is a member of the church who is being prosecuted on the job, being persecuted on the job because of the Sabbath, they would, they would write to me and I would, if needs be, get an attorney or whatever. Uh, that's my office. I'm supposed to ensure that, that members are okay as the public affairs or religious liberty director. Now, follow me. One girl wrote to me, we're talking about the power of God, and she, was, she, she outlined a catalog of problems she was having on the job. She said, oh, the boss is trying to force me to work on Saturday and threatening to fight me and all sorts of things. And, and she wrote this long email to me. Now, I started to read the email, and when I thought I got the gist of it, I stopped reading. I shouldn't have done that, Pastor. I should have read all the whole thing. But it was very long. And, you know, when I thought I got it, I stopped. But I shouldn't have. So I was at my home on Friday morning, and the phone rang, and it was her. She said to me, Oh, Pastor Gordon, it's really tough on the job now. Uh, I said, Okay. I'm going to write to your boss. So I got before my computer, and I drafted a letter to her boss. And then I said, I'm not going to email the letter to my secretary at the office so that she can fix the margin and do the stuff that secretaries do. But then the idea came to me, maybe I should just copy the letter to the young lady so that she could see what I'm sending to her boss. So I looked for the email that she had sent to me, and I attached and attached a letter to, 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 to it so that as I send it to my secretary, it also goes to her. So she called me back and she said to me, Pastor, I, I really need to talk to you somewhere. I said, have you seen the letter that I drafted to send to your, your boss? Um, I, I am sending it to my secretary, but I have sent you a copy so that you could see it. She said, Pastor Gordon, which email address did you use? I said, the same one that you used to send. So she said, no, Pastor, you didn't read the last part of it. I told her when you reply, you have to use this email address because it's the company's public email address. <laughs> she said, Pastor, you are the whole my enemies are going to see it, the boss is going to see it before it is properly presented to him. We're talking about the power of God. I said, I said to her, my sister, don't worry. My God is real. I said, my sister, don't worry. Have you not read who our God is? Our God can bring down the walls of Jericho and lock the jaws of hungry lions. Our God can make a way in the wilderness and it will rain down bread from heaven. Our God can bring victory out of defeat and calm raising pillars and even resurrect the dead. I say to my sister, we serve a big God and God is real. I said, hold on a moment. She said, I'll call you back. She hung up the phone and I got on my knees and I said, God, I know you are real. I know that you've got power. I know you are not just a figment of somebody's imagination. I know you are a real God. So right now, I am asking you to do something that only a God can do. I am asking you to enter into cyberspace and block an email that is already sent. Only a God can do that. While well, I was praying the phone round, I picked it up because the young lady. She said, Pastor, I called the officer and I asked one of my girlfriends to look for the email and delete it. And she said, She hasn't seen it. I went to my computer and as I stand there, I saw failure mail return. <laughs> I am saying to us tonight, beloved friends, that we serve a God who is real. And your God must be real to you. You need to know that when you get on your knees, you're not talking to the ceiling. You need to know that there's a God who is actively involved in everything that concerns his children. You need to know that our God still sits on the throne and he cares about his own. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to tell you further that God wants to share the power with us, he says in Luke, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, he says, Behold, I give you power 
over all the part the kingdoms of darkness. The trail of one scorpions. That's what God says. Now, God says it and it's real, then it has to be true. That as Christians, we can tread upon scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. Now, let me tell you something. Just before Jesus came the first time, there were lots and lots of demon-possessed people in Palestine. And just before he comes back the second time, there will be a lot of people demon-possessed in our day and time. There are people who are possessed with demons and psychology is powerless to deal with these situations because they're non-medical situations. I have been face to face with rich doctors. I have seen people possessed with demons. This is no whimsical, eerie, theory, Harry Potter stuff. I have seen with my own eyes. I have heard with my own ears the manifestation of demons. But the great God I serve, he says, I give you power over demons. Mm. So there was this young lady. She was doing, well, she was doing some strange stuff. She had supernatural power. She could move things. Her mommy became concerned. I'm telling you what happened. The mommy became concerned. One Friday evening, this little skinny girl, little slim body girl, very small little body, she and her brother, her brother is about three times her size, big, brawny, muscular, and she got into a fight with him, and she whipped him upside down. The mommy said, she, the mom called me, pastor, she flipped him upside down. She put him on the floor, he couldn't move, and then she beared her teeth like a wolf and she was going to bite his neck and I screamed out! And she said, then somebody told me about the prime ministry at the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. Pastor, can you help? My daughter is in trouble. I said, all right, my sister. Tell her to come to my office. The next day. So I called a colleague of mine and I said to him, Now we're going to go into a serious session and I want you to join me. Are you still listening to me? Yes. I said, I want you to join me in my office. I got on the phone and I called my, I'm a part of a, a number of prayer groups, international groups, because I believe there is power in prayer. Somebody say amen. 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 So I called up one of my prayer group members, Sister Rita Dabro, and I said, I want you to cover me with prayer because another pastor and myself, we are going to do battle for the Lord. And we believe that there is a God who says that I've given you power over the enemy and we want you to cover us with prayer. Is that all right? She said, Pastor, I'm calling the other members of the international prayer team right now and we're going to cover you with prayer. You go and do what you have to do for the Lord. We shall be on our knees. Go ahead, my pastor. I said, thank you, my sister. We're going. Now it was time. The young lady came. I started to question her. I said, tell me about it. And she said, Pastor, when I was nine years old, I went to the library and I borrowed a book on witchcraft and stuff, and I read it, I brought it at home, and he said, she said, after a while, I started having some visitors late in the night, some little short, little, and she described an eerie, very eerie tale. But then all of a sudden, her countenance changed, and a rough voice in her said, I'm going to leave now. I'm going to leave now. So, I said to the other pastor, please come, come on. And the voice said, I'm going to leave now. Now. So I said, well, who's saying that to you? She said, no. When the voice said, I'm going to leave now. So I moved from where I was, and I went to the door, my office, and I locked the door. And I said, she ain't going nowhere today. <laughs> I locked the door. And we started to pray. To cut a long story short, we started to pray. 
And we realized that she, there was a battle going on inside of her. She was under the control of demons, but we could tell that she wanted to be delivered. And we started to pray for her. And as we started to pray, all of a sudden, the young lady got superhuman strength. And both uh, Pastor O'Neill and I said, we couldn't put her down. We couldn't keep her sitting on the chair. She was rising up and her strength exceeded ours. We had to call on the name of Jesus. We realized that every time we called on Jesus, her power became a little less. And we called on Jesus and we prayed. We rebuked the spirit and the spirit was stubborn. It was a real battle. We read the scriptures, but we claimed God's power. We said to her, sister, say Jesus. And the voice said, no. I said, say Jesus. The voice said, no. But we prayed and we rebuked. And she said, Jesus. And she sat down. And we knew she had gained the victory. Amen. When she sat down, I said, how do you feel? She said, weak. Thanks be to God from that day. She left the office. She was completely delivered. Hallelujah. I am saying tonight, beloved friends, that we must not go around acting as though there is no God. As Christians, we must be bold and courageous in our declaration that God is real. As I close, I want you to know that as a pastor, I have been to the bedsides of many dying people. I have seen people die. I've seen people dying from gunshot wounds. I have knelt to the victims while the, while, while the paramedics, the, the folks are getting the ambulance, whatever, to. I have knelt down beside people. Water pipes, the nostrils like water pipes of blood. I could tell that gunshots would have done serious damage. I knew they didn't have much time. I tried to, to, to get some word in. I have been to the bedside of sick people, dying people. And I can tell you, when a man is dying and he knows God, he can't fake it. Yes. If he doesn't know God, he can't fake it. When your head is pressing a dying pillow, if you don't know your God at that time, it will become painfully evident. I remember going to the bedside of a gentleman. The nurse called me, said, Pastor Biden, can you share something with him? Here is a man who had lots of money. In fact, for those of us who are from Jamaica, this man owned horses at Caymanas Park. He had five big buses on the road. He had a house. Believe me, it's one of the largest houses I've ever been into. It was a palatial mansion. It was huge. And as I walked up the staircase, they showed me a little game, a little area where he had his little gaming roosters. He had his big shot friends that would bet a hundred thousand dollars on these these important roosters. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And big shot had money. They led me through the corridors to the master bedroom, and you could see signs of wealth everywhere. When I got to the master bedroom, I saw this gentleman, he's of Chinese descent. He had lived in Jamaica for years. They had invited him to church. He would have nothing to do with church. He had money. He had visas. He had girls. He had friends who gambled with him for big bucks. But now, the cancer had permeated his vital organs, metastasized and permeated his vital organs. His head was pressing a dying pillow. Had money, had girls, had fame, had everything. But now he was dying and there was something he did not have. The nurse said, Pastor, can you share something with him? And as I opened my Bible, he was in great pain. I realized that somehow 
He needed the, the time to reach out and grab the hand of God. But with all the things going on in his life, I left there not even knowing if he had digested what I shared. But when I left him, there was another person they asked me to see. This time, the house was different. It was a little shack on the side of the hill. But as I walked up the, that little rocky, rugged pathway to this little shack, I could hear gospel music playing. When I got to the house, I saw a lady, she too had cancer, inoperable cancer. Cancer that had spread metastasized to the bone. She was in great pain. Instead, she raised her hand. Her face was contorted with excruciating pain. But something struck me very keenly on that occasion. You know what it was? Instead of me encouraging her, she started to preach to me. She looked at me and she said, Oh, my little brother, the pain is unbearable. She said, I'm dying, and I know it. She said, the cancer is in my body, but I want to let you know Jesus is in my heart. She said, I am mocking your face. She said, I might not see you alive anymore down here, but one day I'm going to look for you around the throne of God. She was dying, but unlike the other gentleman, she was dying. But for her, God was real. I say to you tonight that after you have lived your life and all is said and done, if you have not grasped the reality of God in a personal and intimate way, then your living would have been in vain. I give you Jesus tonight. I give you a God who cares. I give you a God who wants a relationship with you. Would you like to have a relationship with God and to continue your relationship with God? Please stand to your feet. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. As you have bowed your head, your heads, God is speaking to your hearts. God knows you. He knows those here that if they were to die tonight, they would go to a Christless grave. God knows. He knows the ones who are in his hands. I ask you while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you were to die tonight, could you truly say, I am going to sleep in Jesus? Do you know that God is real? Oh, Father, your people are praying right now. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that to those who have not yet surrendered to you, those who have not yet come to realize and grasp the power that you are real, I ask that you will give them the courage and the strength to say, All to Jesus I surrender. Amen. Lord, I pray that no one will leave here the same way as they came earlier. I ask, O oh God, that your spirit will move through this congregation right now. And give us the faith of that dying sister Camber in a little shot. Give us that experience that even if the fever candle of our existence is blown out by the cold draft of death, we will die knowing that our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Keep us, Father. We want to know you. We want to love you. And we want to love like you. So we give you a search tonight. Put us on the pathway to glory. And by your grace, we shall never look back in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.